I'm Dylan Terrell, Executive Director of Cadiz, Mexico, and this is San Miguel. But it's not exactly quite all of San Miguel, is it? San Miguel isn't just a city, it's a municipality. Municipality responsible for sev several hundred different rural communities. And that's where I want to start the story today, with uh, one of those communities. I want to take you down the road to Juan Gonzalez. Juan Gonzalez is a small rural community of about 67 families a little over 300 people, uh, and none of them have water piped to their house. This community is about 19 kilometers or 12 miles from the city center. If they don't have water, what are they doing? Historically, in this region, um, people are digging uh, artisanal wells. Uh, these are normally 10 to 20 meters deep, open air and filled with lots of bacteria and pathogens. During the rainy season, um, you'll see people drinking from the river or even collecting rain in buckets outside of their home. The lucky few, about a third of the families right now in Juan Gonzalez have rainwater catchment cisterns, so they're able to harvest their rainwater and have enough drinking water for a, a year. This is thanks to organizations like Rotary. Now I want to take you further up north to Ex Hacienda de Jesus. This is uh, another community up in the uh, municipality of San Luis de La Paz. Ex Hacienda is much, much bigger than Juan Gonzalez, about 1,500 people. And unlike Juan Gonzalez, Ex Hacienda does have water. They, after several decades of struggle, uh, won their water rights, and in 1984, they had their first uh, community well built. Unfortunately, several decades later, they are gonna find out that that water is contaminated with toxic levels of arsenic and fluoride. So in keeping with today's theme of Despacio, of Slowing down and also being aware of our space, I want to talk about the space that connects these two communities. These two communities are intimately connected by water um, in the space of the Independence Watershed. The Independence Watershed takes up about seven municipalities in the northern part of Guanajuato, and lying just below is the Independence Aquifer. The Independence Aquifer is split into two sections. The first being the top section, which is the granular section of the aquifer. This is characterized by young water, several months to several hundred years old. And this is where we get most of our water. And then the section down below, the fracture part of the aquifer, this is ancient water. Next slide, please. So thinking about the Independence Aquifer and our history of water here, I just want to step back for a second and look at how we've changed over the past uh, several decades. In the 1940s, more so in the 1950s here in Guanajuato, we made a switch to commercial agriculture with the advent of tube well technology. And with that switch, we started drilling more wells, extracting more and more water uh, to produce crops. And this went on kind of an unsustainable extraction spree that by the early 1980s, we were in a permanent decline of water table levels. This led to the 1983, uh, the final VEDA decree for the state of Guanajuato, which put a ban on the entire state for any deep well drilling, since you need federal permission to, do, to drill any wells. At that time, we had a little under 1,500 wells in this, in this watershed. Uh, today, we have over 3,000. So clearly, we're not, we're not respecting that decree. So with this rate of decline, we're seeing upwards of 10 meters per year in certain parts of the watershed. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's just uh, it's a horrifying number. And with that, we're, we're in, encountering water at lower and lower depths. In the 1950s, we'd see water at 5, 10 meters deep. Today, it's not uncommon to go 200 meters deep before we even encounter water. So with that, we're quite obviously having to drill wells deeper and deeper. In the 1970s, we passed 100 meters. Today, most wells are between 200 and 400 meters deep. So what does this mean? It means we've punctured into that fracture, that lower section of the aquifer, and that ancient water is starting to come up. It's starting to migrate into the granular section where we take our water out. Now, this water is characterized not just by being really old. It's not just thousands, but it's tens of thousands of years old. But it's also been stewing with volcanic rock and taking up different minerals. And um, specifically over the years, we're seeing arsenic and fluoride contamination. So this is not new news. This is not any new information. 
People have been studying this for decades. Uh, Dr. Marcos Adrian Ortega has, has led that study uh, with the arsenic fluoride and overexploitations. Um, but in 2012, we decided with the, the Coalition in Defense of the Independence Aquifer that we wanted to see what's going on today. What are the arsenic fluoride levels like today? Because we're seeing lower and lower water tables, we want to see if they're becoming more concentrated. And we studied about a little over 60 wells affecting some 90 communities in four different municipalities in the watershed so far. And about 50% of those wells were over the limit for arsenic and fluoride. Arsenic levels were seeing two to three times above the Mexican limit, which is to say uh, more than seven times the World Health Organization standards. Next slide. The real issue that we're seeing though, the immediate concern is fluoride. For reference, the maximum allowable limit for fluoride is 1.5 parts per million. Uh, as you can see up in the top there, well I guess you can't see too well, um, but the 18.2, uh, that's actually Ex Hacienda de Jesus. That's that community we started off with today. Uh, those 1,500 people have to drink that water every single day. That is 12 times above the allowable limit. So when we talk about the health effects, fluoride has this really nasty tendency of making itself visible uh, in the first form of dental fluorosis. This is a young girl from one of these communities who's already suffering from severe dental fluorosis. This is gonna later manifest itself into things like crippling skeletal fluorosis and a host of other health concerns. So what can we do? A lot of people are working on different things. There's reverse osmosis systems. Our partners up in Dolores, uh, Sedesa have developed a low cost solar distiller. We ourselves in Caddis have been trying to come up with a low cost filter adapter that can remove it. But when I think about removing arsenic and fluoride from the water, I can't help but come back to this idea that if our rate of extraction continues to be greater than our rate of recharge, we're gonna have less and less water to clean in the first place. So we really need to be looking for new sources of water. Um, the first that comes to mind quite obviously is rainwater. Rainwater has the benefit of not putting stress on our already really fragile aquifer. It's fairly inexpensive to harvest and it's also arsenic and fluoride free. Next slide. Our neighbors up here in Ex Hacienda again, uh, they're on board, they're ready. We had 30 to 40 people, not just from Ex Hacienda, but from four other communities come out to build one rainwater catchment cistern because they wanted to know how to capture their water. They wanted to know how to take advantage of that resource. These are people that have a really intimate connection with their water, something that we're starting to lose here in the cities more and more. We've also been fortunate enough to be putting low cost bacteria filters with existing rainwater catchment cisterns. Um, Rotary, along with the Municipal Water Authority, has put in several hundred right here in San Miguel. And these water filters just ensure that they are not only arsenic and fluoride free, but bacteria and pathogen free as well. And so with that, with these education, the, the education, the water quality testing, and interviews with the families, we've been really lucky that we can sit down and really talk about these issues together and see where we're going with water use and what we can do about it. So I come back one more time to this idea of Despacio of moving slow. And I can't help but think that we don't have that luxury anymore. We don't have the space to move slowly anymore. In September of this past year, next slide please, um, the Coalition Defense of the Independence Aquifer, we, we put these issues in the context of basic human rights violations. And it was brought in front of an international human rights tribunal, the Permanent People's Tribunal. And at that tribunal, they essentially said that because of the gravity of the overexploitation and the contamination of both surface and groundwater, that the Independence Watershed region should be declared a state of emergency or a zone of emergency. Now, the damage is already done. We shouldn't look at this negatively. This is a call to action. We need to do something. So what can we do? Well, as on a personal level, 99% of our consumption is groundwater. If we can start taking advantage of rainwater in our own homes, we can make a big impact. Every shower you take with rainwater, every glass of rainwater you drink, is slowly, slowly allowing our aquifer to begin to heal. But in the bigger picture, our personal consumption really only makes up about 15%. That other 85% is mid to large scale agriculture. <clears throat> These are big, many of which are multinational corporations 
Um, I have to ask, how connected do you think they are to their production? And how efficient are they that they don't have to be? So what can we do? I look here again at the Independence Aquifer, and I realize that it's not just the borders of the aquifer. This aquifer is one of 37 other aquifers that made up the, make up the greater Lerma Chapala. <clears throat> 15 years ago, the World Health Organization, the UNEP, came and did a study of the Lerma Chapala, and they found at that time an estimated 70% of those aquifers were already overexploited. This is connected way down the line. This is a, not just regional, and it's not even just Mexico, this is global. So, the one thing I would challenge everyone here to do to today is that if we want to begin to repair this relationship, we need, to more, we need to do much more than just admit there's a problem. We need to understand what that problem is and how that affects our neighbors. So I challenge everyone to go home today and just turn off your water. Just shut it down for a day. See how long you can last. Um, all this work is a culmination of many other actors, and I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge them. Thank you.